Rob Schneider, actor, comedian, screenwriter, director, lover, gigolo, <laughs> a stand-up comic and veteran of Saturday Night Live. Schneider has gone on to a successful career in films, including starring roles in the comedy films Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, The Hot Chick, and Grown Ups. His new comedy special, Woke Up in America, is available on Fox Nation. Welcome to the show, Thank you Rob so Schneider. much, Jimmy. Thank you so much for being here. I wanted to thank you for uh, helping me do one of the uh voices in my head of of uh not giving into the lunacy the last couple of years because it really wasn't there wasn't like people in the i should say mainstream media that you could rely on there was no cronkite no you know we didn't have it every and it, it kind of great because it really did expose what's all i guess it's always been there and it just kind of brought it to the fore um just the um mainstream media is just a complete mouthpiece for um uh, you know, for government and for industry. And it's like everything that, um, you know, Noam Chomsky had said, you know, about, like he said, everybody knew Pravda and Tass was a government mouthpiece, but it's just much more insidious in a so-called democracy where, uh, you know, the propaganda is so much deeply ingrained that people believe it. People didn't believe Tass and, and, and the Soviet Union. They knew that they counted on word of mouth. So what's kind of happened was it's a similar thing, don't you think, where people relied on word of mouth. And as you say in your brilliant comedy routine about like reading, <laughs> it's so perfect, you know? It's just anyone who's against people trying to become informed and that that was a real thing. I mean, that, that was a that was a real push. Don't look up stuff yourself. Don't look into this experimental <laughs> medical d experiment that you're forced to take part in, or you can't go to work, or you can't travel, <laughs> yeah. or you can't you can't visit your uh, your family when they're dying in the hospital. You can't do yeah. anything. And people, comedians. That's the thing for me, Rob. That was so that bad. Hurt. Was that comedians would get on stage and shame people for trying to be informed about a medical treatment they're they're actually at, 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 pretending to be intellectual but it's actually <laughs> anti-intellectual it is because what they're telling you stop trying to get informed about stuff it was embarrassing for me like and uh, i i don't uh I, it's it's because you, you think about like you know hitler's willing executioners it was a daniel goldman not goldman but goldberg or gold uh, some Jew wrote it for sure. Ha. And um, but he talked about how like, you know, it's the old expression about how, uh, the, the, you know, there was a lie in, in like um, in, edu in educational circles in academia that, uh, you know, Germany was a lot like us. And um, and that the, this thing, if these situations happened, it, it that's what uh, started. And he said that wasn't true. It wasn't the economic wasn't just the economic devastation that happened there. Um, it was also the, one of the cornerstones of European society. One of the foundational thinking was anti-Semitism. So that that came out. And I've always agreed that like, well, that couldn't happen here. But now you realize it absolutely could. The treatment of the, quote, unvaccinated. And like when you saw Jimmy Kimmel on, on, um, on TV saying like, don't help these people and mm -hmm. Pierce... Morgan, is that his name? Yeah. Uh, it just, it was, uh, and George Clooney and Sean Penn. I would like, these guys would have been very comfortable still performing for like in Berlin in the late 30s. You know, I think th this is, it, it isn't that far removed from like uh, that, that um, you know, the same thing as, as anti-Semitism, in my opinion. You know? it, it was scary. Um, it did expose the little Hitlers amongst us, didn't well, there's, it? There's a there's a saying. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying: "Scratch a liberal, and underneath there's a fascist." Did you ever hear that? <laughs> no. I, yes. Well, I've always I always thought I was a liberal. Me I always too. Thought I was. And I then, am. I'm just. But I mean, if you question, it, then you're a right winger. If that's right, all you. It's exactly it. All you do is question one thing about the establishment. So what has happened in the era of Trump is that the Democratic Party stopped being against the establishment. Yeah. They became they the became, establishment. Yeah. And then they became very cult-like. And, it, it and if you ask a question that goes against what is approved inside that Democratic Party, you are now an outsider. They do it to, they did it to yeah. John Stewart when he did that joke on Stephen Colbert right. about where the Wuhan virus, where the COVID virus came from, the <laughs> Wuhan lab. And then he was ostracized. <laughs> they vote like a block. It's the thing is, what you realize about the Democratic Party and traditional liberals, they function really well when they have no power. When they don't have power, then they can serve the people and try to serve the people. But when they do, they don't. There's absolutely nothing that the that the liberals are doing now that are helping people. I really believe that. 
And so, I, I mean, the, tr the liberals in power, whereas traditional liberals like us, which is you and me, mm -hmm. I think <laughs> as now, if you dare to question any of it, you're out, you're out and you're out forever because you either go along and vote with the block. There's like, that's why like, people, the Democrats are making, we're, we're saying, God, the Republicans um, in Congress, they're fighting over, you know, who's going to be speaker. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Right. Exactly. You're supposed to fight and argue over, so not vote in a complete block. You know, which is very telling of where where we're at and what, you know, the so-called liberals are at. And and I would love to get back to traditional liberalism, you know. Well, well we, we helped elect these people called Justice Democrats, right? Now, I, I don't know if you're aware of that, but yeah. uh, so they were supposed to be, they were Bernie Sanders kind of acolytes. I gave money to Bernie Sanders. We all did. And so, and, and, and the idea was that they would get elected mm -hmm. and then they would be the opposition to Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic corporate machine that's owned by the military industrial complex and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, pharma. and big pharma and Wall Street. Yeah. And when, so we got them elected. We were all excited. AOC's the leader. And then they didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. They didn't do anything. And we said, no, you're, this was what you said you were elected to do. And they were like, you're a bad person for asking them to do what they campaigned on. They said I wasn't qualified to be an activist. I wasn't. <laughs> that said that. They said that. I, AOC was a bartender five minutes ago, <laughs> yeah. but somehow I'm not uh, enough. Yeah. And so. How dare you call them on their promises? And so now, it used to be like there used to be the far left side of the Democratic Party that always opposed war and always opposed the military. Yeah. That they're, they're all gone. They're all war pigs from and Bernie. It's, and it's also the you got to say the Republican Party too. Not one Republican. You, you know, like you see Ted no, the, Cruz the, talks the, a good game, but when it comes to opposing these forever wars, he will never. So I, you know, I don't have the it, only opposition to the. I, I'm sad to say the only opposition to war now coming from elected people at the federal level is from the far right. Right. So they're the yeah. only ones that they wanted to pull the troops out of Syria. Yeah. And they could, although they're horrible on other issues, like Matt Getz is horrible on China, but he was good on that. And yeah. so you work with them when they're on that. Exactly. You know? Work with them when they're on that. I agree. And and I'm going to work with anyone who's going to question this, um, uh, this certain stagnation that we have in politics. And that's why, like, tomorrow I'm doing a fundraiser for Robert Kennedy Jr. Oh, really? Where? Uh, it's um, somewhere out in Pacific Palisades someplace. Okay. But it, it, what, at least with his popularity that he has now. And if you've heard any of uh, if you heard any of his speeches, he is forcing he is, if whatever success he has, and there's also the, there's the delegates, and then there's the super delegates to overrule the regular delegates. Uh, but what, what he is going to force uh, when the primaries come in, because I think he he will win one of the two first primaries, and he will force people to begin uh, to discuss some of these issues, which is really the thing that that could really help, uh, you know democracy in this country or can can help uh restore some faith in it uh would be the uh to put a firewall between industry and the regulatory bodies that are supposed to govern industry that would be nice wouldn't it that, that would be nice we wouldn't have had this covid nightmare had that been the case because as we know the fda is is supported 70 percent funded by big pharma right they have to pay a license fee to try to get it and i think it's a fifty thousand, or at least it used to be 10 years ago but you have you have like a julie gerber ding Head of the CDC vaccine division, and then she leaves a week later. She's the head of Merck. Now, there's there's, there's got to be a problem with that. I think there has to be a five year or at least a two year firewall with industry, so you can't go back and forth. I mean, it just it's a no brainer. And then you think, ah, you know, how much how much you know? A lot of Americans, especially when I was li still living in L.A. before I got the hell out of here, it was was you know I, I heard from agents and powerful people um, who were like, ah, this doesn't really affect me. Like, ah, I didn't. I just the attitude was this isn't going to affect. This isn't about me. And it's, it's gonna they're gonna come get you. They are. This will affect you eventually. You know, people say, stay out of politics. Politics is the food you eat. It's the air you breathe. It's the roads you drive on. It's your it's your, it's your your right um, to go to work, to get to work. And so uh, it, eventually it is going to affect you. And if they could shut down the world and they have no safeguards in place to stop it from happening again, none. So the governmental controls, the legislative legislatures in different states have not put any actions, not one state, to prevent it from happening again. There are some legislation that is happening uh, with some rights for people uh, to stop, uh, like, say, vaccine mandates. But, for instance, there has not been any legislation like, you know, the uh, Republicans in, uh, in Michigan. I haven't heard anything where they could stop Whitmer from doing it again. 
Um, you're you're right, but I think the people this time, I think would put, I would hope would push back a lot harder, especially the people. I mean, the way they crushed people's businesses and did nothing for them. It is just, so sad to see right here in yeah. L.A. where they where the, they have um, an outside catering for a movie co- or TV show, and then that that woman said, it's right down the street. I, I just was not, it's so so stunning they, hypocrisy. She had an outside cafe, yeah, and they said that she could not open and serve people because of COVID. And right across the street from her, they were shooting a movie, and they had set up tables where there was about a hundred people who were working on that movie. We're going to sit down and have lunch. Yeah, and she's like, they can do that. And well, the reason why they can do that is because that movie is being financed by a bank that has Gavin Newsom in his back pocket and the rest of the people. So that's what this is. And that <laughs> yeah. lady who owned that uh, yeah. one restaurant doesn't. She's not a political donor, so they're going to shut her down and they're going to let the movie yeah. business keep going because they own the politicians. That's the world we're living in. The lesson is become a donor. That that's is what the, I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've become a donor, Jimmy. That's the lesson I've learned. <laughs> well, spend your spend your Hollywood money <laughs> and and get and stay open. Well, well you know, how did you how did you seriously? My question for you is: How did you get to the point where you decided to like you were going to risk yourself? Um, I mean, I, I was onto the vaccine, you know, stuff early because they came after me for believing parents who said their child was fine and, and then, then wasn't. Mm-hmm. After a series right. of you know eight to eleven uh, doses of a vaccine from a wellness visit, interestingly, people should look this up. That uh, during COVID, when people did not go to their, see their pediatrician to see the uh, mortality for infants, we're thirty seventh in infant mortality. Thirty yes. seventh, we're one above uh, Bolivia and one. Oh no, sorry, one above Nigeria, one below uh, Bolivia for first day infant deaths, and that. Uh, the the baby um, the uh, SIDS had dropped off during this time, so that's an interesting statistic that that has did not get enough attention. But so you know, when you say there's a direct correlation, you know, causation correlation, I think that's all crap. I think you have to look at all of it, and we have to be able to live in a society where you question everything. You know, and again, to quote Noam Chomsky, he said, "America's allowed to have really." Um, you can have debates and a really violent debates about small amounts of subjects, but you move outside of that and you question the military industrial complex. You can question, you know, the, the pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, which pays for 85% of all ads on television and the internet during a non-election year. When you start to step outside that and question that, then you become an enemy and you got to be destroyed. And so that happened to me, uh, 10, 12 years ago. So when this came up, I knew I said, ah, it's coming. What Here what happened? What happened 10, 12 years ago? What was the I issue? did a no, I I made the mistake of doing a, a commercial for State Farm and um I got talked into doing it by um <laughs> by my dumb attorney at the time. And uh, it was like money and I was finishing my TV show. I had funded my TV show myself and it was like a chunk of change. One of the things is like, you know, it's hard to say no. And it was a, an old uh, 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 character that I did on Saturday Night Live. But what happened was I had also done a, uh, a um, you know, a, a, a promotional thing for parents who had injured children and who believed that their, their children were injured because of pharmaceutical products that are completely liability free. And so they were, they're convinced that, that that happened. And I believe them. They know their kids, you know, your kids more than anybody. So, um, when that, when that thing came out, uh, like 10, 12 years ago, there was a, uh, n- not a lot of people, but at that time, I think it was people that, uh, you know, enough people, uh, that were pharma based people who can, you know, say to State Farm, hey, you're supporting this, blah, blah, blah. And they they pulled it down. And it just ended up being really bad press more than anything else. But the point of the matter is, was like, you could see the power, the tentacles of how they could make it seem like it's a grassroots movement. But you are not allowed to question it. You are not allowed to question it. And that's why, as far as, you know, I'm grateful to you and, you know, one of the few people who were able to say early that and call it and say, you know, this, we have a right to question this. If you're going to demand this, and that was what's so interesting to me about like another liberal talking point of, um, you know, pro women's rights and, you know, my body, my choice. <laughs> and like that was such a gl- glaring inconsistency. My body, my choice, except when it came to injecting me with <laughs> my right. body with, with untested, uh, you know, gene therapy, biologicals that are gene therapy that they admit is a gene therapy. Yeah. And I remember people attacking me. It's not a gene therapy. You would get kicked off Twitter if you said that at yeah. first. Yeah, absolutely. But now everybody kind of admits that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that happened to me, and I was very grateful. You one of the people I was listening to who was able to like stay the course and and just to talk and discuss and ask questions. Well, you know, I thought it would I, it would give me some legitimacy because I was legit vaccine injured, and so I thought that that would make people. It didn't. They yeah. didn't give. They they told me it was my fault because I had a pre existing bone condition. That's why. Yeah, well, that's why you don't mandate stuff like this. And yeah, you, there's no drug that's a hundred percent safe a hundred percent of the time for a hundred percent of the people. Right. If there's not choice, you have tyranny. That's like when they attacked violently attacked Eric Clapton and going finding Wasn't stuff from that him. Crazy? It, it really showed you, like, shut up. You are not allowed to speak. You cannot say what happened to you. Now, now, that is an interesting place to be, isn't it? Yes. Now, that's the, that is the Rubicon that we have crossed. That you can't tell what happened to you. And yeah. if you do, they called him a racist. <laughs> yeah. They called him a racist. All, just all of a sudden, they go went back oh, yeah. to something he said in 1969 or 79. 79. Yeah, at, when he was drunk. When he was drunk on yeah. stage. And you're like, what? And, and that's another thing. Just, there's no. I uh, never heard any of this. <laughs> yeah. I never heard any of I this know. before. All I heard was how Eric Clapton was everybody's hero. I know. Eric Clapton was probably the nicest guy that when I was on SNL, the nicest guy, musical host we'd ever had. He actually stayed and did a concert just for us after the show. No kidding. Just an incredible guy. I mean, what I mean, a racist. Yeah. What a- <laughs> so, but what, what happens though, I just got to a point where I just said, you know what? Uh, I can't, I can't be quiet about this. I, I'm just not going to. And like, and that was a uh, tough position to take in show business where, you know, where, and, and you understand, cause it's like every actor is just coming from a place of like, please hire me, please. And then the studios are all like, they don't want any controversy whatsoever. They don't want anybody with a voice. They don't want people, unless it's the right voice. You can have Charlize Theron saying like, I will fuck up anybody who says, you know what I'm saying? And then she goes back to work at the studio the next day. If you do that from the wrong perspective, if you do it from from a, from a point of questioning the uh, ideology or the pharmaceutical indoctrination of our society, then... You don't go back to work the next day, do you? No, you do not go back. You know, <laughs> for, for, for me, the big cross with Hollywood came when I wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016 after they stole the primary from Bernie Sanders. Exactly, yeah. and, and when I say stole, I mean, they admitted in their books. Uh, <laughs> Donna Brazil <laughs> talked yeah. about how she discovered the contract that showed that the whole primary was rigged and that Hillary Clinton was running things. <laughs> yeah. And so it's not again, they, but they make it like you're some kind of right wing conspiracy theorist yeah. uh, for saying that. And so I was done voting for, and then just that, I mean, that's the, enough, the, isn't it? The, the executive, I never forget the executive producer of modern family tweeted at me about how I'm just a, I said, sound just like a right wing nut job because I had yeah, I get that my show was on KPFK 90.7 here and so I guess that's how she heard it mm. and it's just I mean that's the top of the number yeah. one show and the top 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 person at the number one show yeah. is telling Hollywood Jimmy Dore's a right winger you have to you, what you have to do is is to um is to really say what they're really saying is to I kind of you have to kind of it's a um, it, it the logic and what they're really saying is shut up and go along with it. Don't yes. question it because the other side is that much worse. That's, that's what they're really saying. They have that's all they have, Rob. Yeah, the other side is so much worse. You you have to say with what we have to go with this. Like for instance, what was really interesting is like it is a proven fact that the 1960 election was was stolen. Back then, the Florida of their time. Was, was Cook County? Was Illinois? Yeah, yeah, Cook County. And dead people did vote. And as a matter of fact, a very interesting thing was that uh, Nixon in the ni- after the nineteen sixty election, which was razor thin. Again, it came down to Illinois. Uh, they his advisor said to him, "We can fight this," and he said, "No, it's much more important the peaceful transfer of power." So you know, Nixon for all his problems, or whatever, he's truly the last progressive president that we had. The that's, last that's actually true. progressive president that we had, you know, you had Title IX, the, he put in the EPA, you know, he was actually for universal, and you can look this up, he was for universal health care. The person that torpedoed it was- Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy, exactly. Thank you very much. So we would have go. universal health care if we it would. wasn't for Ted Kennedy that screwed it up because he wanted his plan, right? He did want his plan, wanted credit for it, and, did, and then axed it and regretted it later. But you have like, well, what I really, really appreciate about Robert Kennedy and why I'm supporting him for president and why I think there is a chance to uh, to shake things up at the very least, but hopefully get a chance to have, you know, a real Democrat in the White House. Um, 
is because he's going to talk about things that, that really affect Americans. Like we have to get a handle on the fact that 54% of our, and this is an old 12 year old study that they've not re-upped according to the NIH. We have 54% of our children that have chronic illness and suffer from chronic illness, whether it's neurological, whether it's ADHD, autism. We have a real, we have a, we have a 60, we have 60 percent of our, our population is obese. We cannot continue. We're not going to be able to afford to have this kind of society that we have now if this continues. We, I mean, you're going to, in 10 years, we're going to be bankrupt. Uh, how are we going to afford to take care of all these sick people? We already can't, right? We already spend twice as much uh, for worse outcomes than the rest of the world. You made yeah. that stat that there were 37th and in infant mortality first day. I mean, it's the, we're, we're around 38 or 40 when it comes to ranking of healthcare systems in yeah. the world. And we pay twice as much as the rest of the world for horrible outcomes. And it's because I try to explain to people, they think our government is regular corrupt, meaning like Joe Biden got his kid a no-show job on a utility board in Ukraine, or Trump got his kid hooked yeah. up with the Saudis. But what they don't realize is that everything the government does pretty much is run on corruption, which is why we can send $100 billion to Ukraine at the snap of a finger without any debate, no op-eds, nobody had to, was asked if they think, yeah. and we still won't fix the homeless problem in America, which that could have yeah. fixed four times over. We could have fixed that. We could have, if you throw ten billion at the homeless problem. Yeah, you could. That, make, would, that would do. A, that would at least that would could fix fifty percent of it. Yes, fifty yeah. percent of it. Just pick pick the, the top ten cities, and you can wipe out homelessness with about ten billion dollars. You can, and you know the thing about it is like you know Gabor Mate. If anybody doesn't know him, Doctor Gabor Mate, he's been on the show. Well, he, he's just a brilliant guy, but he also needs to talk about the not just we need to have treatment for the trauma for these these people. We need to have treatment. We can't just continue to like what's happening in San Francisco where I'm from. We just throw money at them and just give them drugs and needles. I mean, I, I do think what it is is well intentioned, but it is not well thought out and it is not working when something isn't working. We need to re think it and we need to call it and and maybe make some real adjustments to how we're dealing with uh with this real drug problem because the problem is i mean i remember well it was created by big pharma and they got half the country hooked on heroin right which was legal heroin. Yeah. yeah and you know what happened was i remember seeing legal drugs in amsterdam i, I remember the ads over there just just say no to hard drugs you know as if say yes to <laughs> soft drugs but what happens is <laughs> Soft drugs do lead to other drugs. And not only that, but and especially in Amsterdam, you had hard drugs piggybacking on top of soft drugs. So we can make money on hashish and marijuana, but we can make money on heroin too. So it's just, they don't care. It just comes in. So I can't say that Colorado is better now since they've had legal marijuana. You can't say that. You well, know? What, what I would say is it we're, we're certainly better having people who use marijuana not in prison. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's what we have to, that is for sure. You have to look at that and say that that, that is a, uh, you know, imprisoning people for light drug offenses is wrong. Mm -hmm. But but also, you can't just be giving them drugs on the street either. This isn't working. We have to be able to, uh, th this, if you're going to throw money at something, throw money at this, throw money on treatment. I'm all for it. Right. Throw money at like the Reagan administration, when they cut out all the money for mental health, when they cut when they cut down uh, in, in under the Reagan administration in California, they, and then just it created the beginnings of the homeless problem. You had that. You had like mental health, and you had um, you know you got to look that up. But they they did. No, it's definitely when when Ronald Reagan defunded the cities, they closed down the mental health facilities, and we that, had homeless people in America for the first time in my life, and that was in the eighties. That was in the eighties. That's where it started, mm -hmm. and then of course it picked up after the ACLU started fighting cities who wanted to, like not have camping. You know, <laughs> so that so when you have so when you allow camping in a city, yeah, and I understand the impulse. I right? understand the impulse too. You want to help. You want to help people that are most vulnerable. But well, all that does is create two problems now. Yeah. So now you have two problems. So now you have a person who's homeless, and you have a person who's homeless who's now camping on a street yeah. in a residential area that and create. That creates an unsafe situation for a lot of people. All that brings in is drugs and and then and, and crime and, and, and the potential for and the, violence. And the weird thing is, Rob, the only politician I can find that's talking about it, Donald Trump. 
Donald Trump is the only politician who's talking about homelessness, and he has a plan. I disagree with his plan, but he's got one, <laughs> and he's at least talking about it. His plan is to set up tent cities outside of the city, and then you send medical people there, and you you can, and you have bathrooms and th- and stuff for them, and and you, but. I, I, that's at least he's talking about it, and that's yeah. an idea that's better than what they're doing now. Yeah, I, I agree. You have uh, you have a system that's broken. You have a system that's not working. You have a system that's getting worse. You have like I'm from San Francisco. In San Francisco, I had to pay money to uh, remove the toilets in front of my house, and they were flower pots. Twenty five thousand dollars. Really? Yeah. And so I said, "Well, it's time to move." Then, isn't it? So and I, I hate, oh I hate to give up. I hate to give up on uh, on California. And oh I love God. this state. It's still the most beautiful, incredible place on the planet. But we have to make some decisions that are not going to be perfect. But we have to do it. It's not kind to have people living at the end of your driveway. It is not tolerant to 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 just continue to give drugs and continue to have people live in squalor. It isn't. I mean, just ignoring uh, like twenty years ago that it was all on Fifth Street. That wasn't okay either. You know, that's not okay either. We have to, you know, these are Americans. You need to be able to uh, to help them and, and realize that the treatment, if you're going to throw money, like we throw money around. Oh, boy, boy, do we. Well, then throw it at treatment and throw, but but make it treatment. And throw Don't it make at affordable it more housing. You know, 40% of homeless people have jobs. Okay. Right? Well, that's, that's a stunning statistic. Isn't that a stunning statistic? At some point in the year, f- from 40 to 44% of homeless people will be employed. But the problem, we've all seen those news stories where they're living in their cars. They can't afford housing. Yeah. We're in such an endscape of a, of, of a capitalistic nights, nightmare, right? Because yeah. it's doing exactly what they always said capitalism would do. It would eat itself. It's got control of the government. And now it's just siphoning the... Uh, it, upward transfer of wealth during so that CARES Act was five trillion dollars of corruption that went right to the richest one thousand. We created how many billionaires during COVID as we crushed the workers? Hundreds. Yes, hundreds yeah. of billionaires got created during COVID. Three hundred eighteen, or whatever it was. Something yes, like that. it sounds like a good number, doesn't it? So. Um, this is actually a very, I mean, this is a real special for me to be able to meet you and to talk to you because I don't know if you care, but you know, your HBO young comedian special, I was, it was right when I was getting ready to be a comedian Oh, that's and so cool. Dennis Miller's black and white special, Oh yeah, Killer. Which, which to me was maybe the best special of all time ever. Just a, it was just, it captured him, right? You yeah. know how it's a lot of most TV cat stand up specials don't capture the, it's yeah. hard. It is hard. But that black and white. Well, that was, you know, he is a brilliant, brilliant comedian who was able to define himself through his material and and make it like a like a like a sculpture, you know, just chisel away, chisel away until you find that Dennis Miller special. And he's one of those brilliant guys. And I got to tell you, I disagreed with him. Uh, completely, because I didn't understand where he was going when he when he was call, when he was attacking after nine eleven, attacking the the liberal intelligentsia. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't understand, and it made me angry. And I have to admit that I was wrong, and he was right. I really did come around. And Dennis, I apologize. You are one hundred percent right. And and uh, you know, not about everything, but I would say that what he was calling out for uh, blatant hypocrisy was blatant hypocrisy. And yeah, and but thank you for that because I, I do think like Dennis. Dennis's contribution to comedy is multifaceted because not only was he a brilliant original comic in a tough era where it was tough to be brilliant and it was tough to be original and to stand out, but he also discovered and championed comedians like myself, David Spade, yeah, Adam Sandler. He was personally responsible for the three of us uh, and our success getting on Saturday Night Live. He was. Really? He was. That was Dennis Miller pushing for us out of his own, I mean, out of his own, uh, just out of his own, how much he loved comedy and said, these guys are funny. These guys are the next guys. That was Dennis Miller. That's Dennis Miller as a great guy, as a, as a great comedian. And as, as also, um, a real supporter of the art of stand up. So when I got the young comedian special, that was like, uh, you know, a stunning acceptance. So like, I remember like he stood next to me when I got on the David Letterman show and he says, you're in now. And I go, what do you mean? I'm in, you're in, you're in. You're in, in. You're in, pal. You're in showbiz now. That's it. You're in. And, uh, I was like, and so, and then the HBO Young Comedian special was you're in, in. And then, because you, you know, you never know if you're in or when you're out. Yes. You know, you're either on, like Chris Rock says, you know, they got a list every day. Who's on that list is on the A list. They don't tell you when you're off it, but you're off it. You know you're off it. And that's true. You know, so it's tough because I've had very, uh, I've been very lucky. 
have some success to make a few movies and it's just it's been it's been an incredible ride but i will say that like to me the last couple of years performing live and you know this the audience's response to you for not just giving them what the same crap that they're seeing mm -hmm. on TV. And that was this, that was so depressing to me was seeing how how replaceable all the late night jokes were. Oh how my God. how they could have changed places and it was the same crap. The no one questioning anything. Not not no questions whatsoever and they're all doing this their own version of the same joke. Yeah. They were all doing the same version of the, and Stephen Colbert. There's no bigger heartbreak for me. I loved his show oh, when yeah. he had that show. He's never been less funny. I'm it's, sorry. He, it's the opposite of. Funny. And he is a brilliant, brilliant comic. He's mind. a used car salesman now. He's I a know. used car salesman. When they when they did that dancing of the needles, I went like, oh, "Wow, my god!" That was just so sad to me because what it is is like you have, like I said, as you know, if there's potential risk. You have to have choice or you don't. You have medical tyranny. And that was one of the things that like I really, really appreciate. And I know they're attacking Robert Kennedy Jr., you know, and they're going to keep attacking him in every way that they can. But I, I, I do want to hopefully if, if there's anything and, and like and truthfully, like, you know, my if you go on the, the mainstream media about me, it's just like he's an anti-vaxxer, you know, like, anti-vaxxer. Like what? You know, it's like. If some, you know, if, if some girl doesn't want to have sex with you, does that make her anti-dick? You know, <laughs> there's got to be choice. So, uh, but I, I, I am grateful to you and for like people like, I remember when Tucker Carlson first stepped his toe into it. I remember because Bobby Kennedy told me, he said like, I'll give you five minutes, say whatever you want in this five minutes. That was the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. So you got five minutes. That's all they, you know, and that was all that they would give him. Mm -hmm. And then he came around, but he came around because the illiberal silencing of people became so obvious that they created, they pushed so hard that it collapsed. It didn't collapse completely, but they did collapse. And I do think that like, you know, I have to look at this historically. I have to look at this to have faith and to have um, some hope. You have to look at something like, um, leaded gas. They knew in the late 1920s that leaded gas in inner city areas where it was the densest that that leaded gas was creating people to be, to create violence and murders were, <laughs> were, were have because of the lead that people were breathing in. And that was a, they knew that in the late twenties, it took until the late seventies, 1980 for them to take it out. So that was 60 years. So and, I'm hopeful that it, it's going to happen for, for this with medical choice and medical rights. Yeah, people don't realize that the, the, you know, the reason why violence and crime has been steadily going down yeah. is one of, the, one of the reasons that they attribute to it is that they took lead out of the gasoline. And that that lead affected people and made them more violent, made them. And so it is crazy what you see. Yeah, yeah. So m m maybe now we'll get some sanity coming. I don't have kids, but I understand it's 82 shots or something now. It's some 69 shots of 14 different. That's 60, 69 doses of 14 different vaccines before the age of 18, 49 before the age of six. You can just see the needles. They have a baby and the needles around it. And I'm saying, look, obviously you have to look at everything, but you have to consider if you care about children, the most, the, the future of our, of humanity, if you care about your country, if you care about like seeing why our test, test scores going down, why our autism, it used to be one in 10,000 when you and I were kids. Now it is one in 24 boys. One in 35 kids. And that is a two-year-old statistic. So that, I mean, it's stunning. And if you look at the rise and how many shots you're getting, we have to be able to question this. Why as a society are we allowing people to silence this question about our children? This has to, this, that's why Robert Kennedy has to, uh, will get uh, these questions out there. And then it'll be decided if people really care about this. Then it's going to be up to people. Um, well, as you know what just happened with Joe Rogan and Hotez? Beautiful, wasn't that? Because I've known about him as a stooge, a pharma stooge, along with Offit. These guys were evil pharma stooges that called for the arrest of people and like bring in the Justice Department. But finally being exposed for the charlatan that he is, Hotez. And that is really, I mean, when you're a respected person who also has a ton of respect for you, Glenn Greenwald, when he tweets about it, when he says, well, this, you know, mm -hmm. you have to go like, well, he is the most respected journalist of the last 
you know, the last 10 years, at least. Who can compare with him? Yeah. And I really you, have a ton of respect you think for him. Anderson Cooper's up there? <laughs> Don Lemon? Him in the water what, with a guy. That's beautiful. That just says everything, doesn't it? And there are cameras everywhere now, but the internet lasts forever. So seeing him attacked was beautiful, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. I shouldn't say attacked. Not exposed. attacked, criticized. Exposed, yeah, and he can't take it. At all, he can't take criticism. And I, 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 I want to read you this. This is from Carl Sagan. Now, we grew up with Carl Sagan. I love Carl Sagan. Everybody loves Carl Sagan. Yeah. And he said, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan. And that's what Hotez is saying. Yeah. You're not allowed to interrogate those who tell us something is true. That's just for the people and doctors and scientists and peer-reviewed journals. that They're going to question it. You don't get to, you regular person. Know, Neil and deGrasse Tyson. That's exactly right. And Neil he, deGrasse. I, I, that, I don't care about individual scientists. I just care about consensus. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you exclude all the people who disagree with your consensus, it's really easy to get a consensus, isn't it? Especially yeah. when you exclude the leading scientists in their field, like Dr. Robert Malone, McCullough, all those oh, guys. Yeah. yeah, when you cherry pick the data which is what they did they cherry pick the data and take the stuff out that they want and that's why like the pharmaceutical industry and like the FDA they are allowing the pharmaceutical companies to do their own research and then cherry pick yep. their own cherry pick their own data and exclude people that they don't want and nobody got upset, Rob, when the FDA wasn't going to release the vaccine trial data for 75 <laughs> years yeah. 75 years like did Pfizer kill Kennedy? What the f? Seventy five years they were not going to, and no, everybody's like, it's normal. You shut up, anti vaxxer Shut yeah. up. And, that's oh, normal. Yeah. Well, I can, and the, the there's a great attorney, Aaron Siri, who fought that, and you know, Aaron Siri is a real medical uh, rights champion, and so is Del Bigtree. You know, it's a, it's an honor to be friends with them, and they fought this, and they won. And they got this stuff released. And it wasn't just Harmeet, uh, I think, uh, also. There's another, there's other people. But I think uh, Aaron Siri was one of the ones responsible for suing to get this information. The public spent the money. The public paid for it. This is our information. We need to see it. So, I mean, but for that not to be an outrage, for them not to, like, go down, for the public to not want to go down and burn Pfizer to the ground is astonishing to me. When you think about the blatant corruption, and that's what happens. You talked about before capitalism and the banking system. What happens is it is for when they lose money, it's socialism. You got to pay. The people, the public have to pay when they lose money. When the banks lose money, when they go bankrupt, they get bailed out by the public, that's right. by us. But when they make profit, they get to keep it. That's right. Pfizer got to keep all the profit. All of it. All of it. And they didn't have to pay for any of the any of the risk. They did, because, And believe me. There is risk. They wouldn't go into any country that wouldn't give them liability. That's right. Isn't that a glaring sign uh, that this isn't in mainstream media lets you know that mainstream media is just a front for pharma. And that's why we have to stop. That's why the first day one, what Robert Kennedy says he will do, if elected president, hopefully he will, is to no longer allow advertising of pharmaceutical products. On television. On television, on the radio. To direct the to only consumer, country we Direct to consumer. Well, us in New Zealand. Yes. That other giant stalwart of freedom. Yeah. And I will say this, if it wasn't for the Second Amendment, I've never been a gun guy. I've never had gun, never owned a gun in my life. But if it wasn't for the Second Amendment, that's the only thing that turned the corner for us. Otherwise, we'd still be in this. We'd still be in this uh, draconian lockdown crap. With, you know, if, if it wasn't for the Second well, Amendment. Well, how so? Just the fact that the people and the government knew that there were guns around. I really believe that that is like, that's, they only can know they can push so far. And luckily, like, eventually... Pretty kind of early, but you had DeSantis waking up and calling some of this bullshit. And the great, the you know, the Surgeon General of Florida, great guy, um, yeah, Lapet Lapidus, I think is his name. And I mean, so I do believe that like that is one of the cornerstones that protected us. I really do for the world and the fact that we're a republic, so that states could make their own decisions. I got out of here and went to Arizona because I felt it was going to be slightly freer. And for my kids, and I got out of here because I saw, I, I knew Gavin Newsom, the writing on the wall, the hypocrisy, and also just, they don't care about kids. And, the, and the, my, my mom, who passed away during the pandemic, she survived COVID, barely, but she survived it. And I, it, I, she was on zero, um, you know, pharmaceutical products. She didn't have any drugs. She made it to almost 93. Um, and, and, you know, at the time she died in California, and um, we still had a funeral for her. And they said, you can't have it. And I said, I'm going to have it. You stop me. Give me some chairs or I'll buy the chairs myself. We're going to have a funeral for my mother. And whoever wants to come is going to come. And so we did. 
you know, and so, and people, there were about 40 people that came and I'm very proud of all of them, but you know, with the time, the risks or whatever, but I knew that California was going to be like a, uh, just a trap. Boom. Cause it's a one party system. It really is. It, oh, don't, don't doubt about it. I tell people, if you want to see what it would look like with complete democratic control, come to California. Come to and California. And if this is what you want, I mean, we still don't have a Medicare for all. We have, they, they all run on it in California. They all get elected and then they never do and it. And you can put it in. If there's any place <laughs> where you can put in me Medicare for all, Medicare for all, it would be in California, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? But they don't want to do that. And that's why they don't really, really want to have all the power because then they will, they'll have nobody to blame. That's right. So so, they, they need somebody, just like the Democrats need Trump. They're desperate for Trump. Do you know how happy the Democrats are that they outlawed or they overturned Roe versus Wade? Oh, yeah. They're doing cartwheels, so oh, they're yeah, so yeah. happy that they... Thank God Obama didn't co codify Roe versus Wade into law because now the Democrats would have nothing to run on. Yeah. And, and he had the chance, didn't he? Or he said it would be the first thing he did. <laughs> he said, and I played the video <laughs> on day one, my first job, I will sign the codify Roe versus Wade. And of course, when he was asked about that at a press conference after he was president, he said, it's not up there. It's not number one on my agenda. Wow. Completely contradicting what he said. How about when he went to the banks and the bank said to him, you know, well, they would have stopped all he, the mortgages. And he said, you take care of the banks. Yes. He you know, took care of the incredible. banks. He was they there. took care of him. He said $30 million day one out. They, he told the bankers, I'm the only thing standing between you and the mob. Yeah. Ma being us. Ma people, being the people the that just elected him. Yeah. The people that he was about to kick out of their homes. 5.1 million families. Not people. Barack Obama kicked 5.1 million families out of their house in those first two years yeah. while he made sure the bankers got their bonuses. And yeah, that's, you know, if that was John McCain, they wouldn't let him do it. That's why they had to get Barack Obama elected. If it was yeah. John McCain, they wouldn't let him kick 5.1 million families. Yeah. They wouldn't let him put kids in cages. They wouldn't let him take us from two wars to seven. But a sweet-talking Barack Obama, they oh, could yeah. do all that and nobody questioned it. And, and win the Nobel it, Prize. <laughs> and give him a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I read today that he's, uh, he's the, the, has the, number, the number one amount of... of uh, of deaths caused by a Nobel Prize winner, was, was Barack, Barack Obama. Obama. Well, he presided <laughs> yeah. over the drone program, which yeah. killed 90% innocent people. You know, if you walk into a, a mall and you mow down 20 people and 18 of them are women and children, you're considered a maniac, homicidal, mass murderer. But yeah. if you do it with a drone, you're considered the greatest president of my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. But boy, is, boy, can he talk, though. Boy, boy so, can he talk. Boy, he certainly can. And he makes us look good. He makes us look like liberals. How, doesn't he? He he doesn't look at that. We invec we elected him. How 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 could we how be could dictators? We, how could we be wrong? How could our wars be wrong? Look at that guy. Well, you know, one in six Barack, uh, one in six Donald Trump voters were Barack Obama voters. Yeah, I and agree with that. I have the guy. I know the guy who uh, ran Bernie's campaign in uh, Iowa, and he told me that they switched from Bernie to Trump. Wow, that's that makes sense. That's why I'm I am hopeful. I mean, do you think Robert Kennedy? has a shot at, at making enough noise to be an issue in the, in the Democratic well, Party. Well, he's definitely already a problem for them. I mean, he's a problem because you can see all the hit pieces coming out, and that's that's what that's about, right? Yeah. And the unions already endorsed Joe Biden a, a year and a half ahead of the election. Oh, yeah. The nurses' union, which is their leadership, is completely corrupt. Same thing, AFL-CIO. The all teachers' union. And teachers' union. Randy Weingarten is the enemy of teachers. Yeah, the enemy of children. And the enemy of children. Yeah. And she's also a liar. We caught her lying on the show many, many times. And so that's the problem with uh, the unions in America is that they're not, they're they're part of the professional managerial class. They don't really represent their rank and file members. They yeah. they're part of the people they're supposed to be organizing against, right? And so that's yeah, all those so that's how you know uh, that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is making a dent is yeah. that they came out eighteen months ahead of the election to endorse him. How will he? And I mean, after he just crushed a workers' strike, he crushed the railroad workers' strike, yeah, and everybody stunning, pretends like it? he didn't do that. Yeah, that should have been stunning, but of course the corporate news says it isn't stunning, no. so nobody walks around thinking it's stunning, right? Well, it is a, um, it's everything that the, the liberals re uh, rejected and, and opposed Reagan. Yeah. It's happening, isn't it? it yes. <laughs> Well, isn't it funny how they're, you know, one charade prosecution of Trump after another. Meanwhile, Barack Obama didn't prosecute George Bush and Dick Cheney for ordering a torture program. 
Yeah. And, we, and he said because he, and that he's constitutionally not allowed to not prosecute them for that. But he didn't anyway, because there's nobody to hold Barack Obama. And he said he's not going to prosecute those people for torture because all those torture crimes happened in the past. And Barack Obama's looking towards the future. Wow. And that you was know, it. All that done. Is, uh, we're not the United States is not part of the international war crimes no, treaty either. No, we don't we don't pr participate in that court. You know, like uh, uh, Henry Kiss Henry Kissinger cannot land in certain countries mm -hmm. because they can arrest him as a war criminal that he is. He just decided to bomb Laos for no reason. <laughs> They're all war criminals though. Yeah. That's the thing. It is and none of this by the way is going to help my career, Jimmy. None you of know, this stuff you're talking about. <laughs> you already you already but you already had a great career. It's, you know what I mean? I have. You know what? That's been the interesting part is like when audiences do come see me live, it is uh, it is like a group hug, you know. And the same thing when they see you. And that's why, like, thank you for being one of the thank you. traditional traditional liberals with a voice that was fearless and also compassionate and didn't mind calling out whatever at your at to, in, a, in a way that didn't help you. It certainly didn't help me. I, <laughs> I already had a very successful show. I was already selling tickets and selling out theaters across the country. I didn't need to stick my chin out over COVID or yeah. the vaccines or anything and have all my friends and other, all, all the friends that were left, <laughs> right, after not voting for Hillary, telling the truth about Russiagate, telling the truth about Syria, and then now telling the truth about COVID, the, the, whoever I hadn't lost, I lost over COVID. <laughs> yeah. They're all gone. All I the know. people who who wrote nice things about me for my book, they're all gone. You know, the thing about it is like, they asked me on Fox News, and I was really tired early in the morning, but they said, have you lost friends over this? And I guess I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, people who my friends have been friends for 30 years, they know I'm nuts, but why would you only want to be friends with people who agree with you? You don't get smooth from smooth. You get it from friction. It's, ah. You know, you, you got it. I want people to question me and whatever crazy decisions that I make so that I can come to a, a better place. Let, let us, that is the whole reason about like a, for debate is let, let's come up with the best ideas and, and let me, let me have to question my own foundational thinking because maybe it needs adjustment. But if we're not going to question it, then we're going to be in a dogmatic place where we are stale. We're stale as a culture. We're stale as a democracy. We're stale creatively, and we cannot grow that way. And I will say that, like, because of the this push and the and because of pharmaceutical industry that would bought off every state senator, I mean, every state congressman, every state assemblyman, every state, and, and then every federal person, because of that gigantic push that happened, it really did expose and open up a window for people who decide to look at it, which is, I think, a lot of people now they can decide if they want this to continue. And I do think that there is an opening now. And I'm hopeful, like, that, and I want to put all my eggs in one basket, but I'm hopeful that, that a candidate like Robert Kennedy, whose father was a very interesting man because he was able to see poverty and was very moved by it. You saw the pictures of him when he went mm -hmm. down to Mississippi, down, mm -hmm. and he saw poverty. He didn't know that kind of poverty existed in that America. That was not part of his, of his, his life in Massachusetts. That is not part of his life when he was living and, and working under the under his brother's administration. But he saw it, and he tried, and he he definitely had let that affect him to where he wanted to do something about it. Now that is a really interesting legacy that I hope and believe that Robert Kennedy Jr. is uh, carrying on and would like to carry on. And I hope as he rises in the polls that the shift. Uh, the inevitable shift that will happen towards the center won't be so much to the center. He'll keep some of that there. And I think he's been so attacked, so, you know, by his own family, by, by the, by the so-called liberal intelligentsia that I think that, I think he's going to continue to take risks and to continue to stand up for what he believes in, because what has he got to lose? Well, they've, it just showed he's got a spine of steel to, for yeah. him to stay with this vaccine criticism the way he stayed with it and he hasn't wavered. And yeah. I, I think it's because he knows he's right and many people would have wavered for sure. Well, you have, what you have is you have, a, you know, because I have had to really think about this being attacked myself and is you, you have to find a way to look at it and historically you look at it. There's a good friend of mine, Andrew Doyle, brilliant comedian from England. And uh, he has a book called The New Puritans. What he really talks about is talk about cancel culture in a way to kind of get to the historical 
perspective on it. Then that that's what I have to do to keep sane. And you, it's real. It's another form of witch burning, but it's a, it's a form of burning now that's like social media burning and canceling. It's the same stuff. It's the same, you know, this puritanical thing. This is purity lesson that you're never going to be able to hit. And anybody who doesn't, who falls from that or, or, or dares question it, they burn at the stake of social media. And that's really where we're at. And what happened with, what happened with with, with a decline in Christianity? Uh, and I'm a Christian. With the the decline of this, you, you have a, a new religion, and it is a religion, a religion of scientism, and to believe in science and to not question it, and that is the new uh, the new religion. And unfortunately, what happens is this medical establishment has become the new science, and if you question it, the the Jesus Christ of this is the vaccine. That's right. And if you question Jesus, their Jesus, mm -hmm. then you you're are a heretic. A, you're a heretic. And we, we need, you know what happens to heretics. They get burned at the stake. Yeah. So you used a word there called, I like, it's called scientism. Yeah. Right? And what that is, that takes, that turns science into religion. Yes. And so you're not allowed to question religion. You're just, but your science, actually, that's how science progresses, is by questioning the yes. as, assumptions of science. And right. so that's what I tell people. That's why we know about the speed of light, black holes, and right. E equals MC squared. All science, all science is, is a series of experiments to find a regularity. Mm -hmm. That's it. So mm -hmm. you need to keep maybe the regularity. You'll find that one, and that happens to be the current regularity. That's our theory for now. And you're constantly, people are constantly questioning E equals MC squared. Just yeah. like Einstein questioned Newton's idea of gravity, not because he was anti-science, but because that's how science works. Right, but also Einstein, it was his, about his the perspective, and they were both right. When you're looking right. at that they're, train, they're both right. right, depending on where you are. Relative. That's the whole <laughs> yes. thing of relativity. <laughs> yes. yes, depending on where you are. So I, I do think that, like, where it, you know, if you take a look at the people who were real liberals back under uh, Roosevelt, and then how they, uh, Truman snuck in there, you look at like you know Union, the guy that was the vice president under Roosevelt at the end, um, a real Union man. Wasn't it? I thought Truman was his. No, no, Truman got in there after in the last time. But there was so you have like they I'm, made him get rid of that guy. Yeah, by the yeah, way. yeah, and, yeah. That so, I know who you're talking yeah, about. It starts with the W. I'm sorry, I'm like. But they made was it Wallace. Maybe it was, yeah. But they made him get rid of that guy as his yeah. vice president. Yeah. So you have like, the, and you have the, the one of the progressive Democrats, you have Woodrow Wilson. If you go look, look back at the Woodrow Wilson administration, you see him uh, vo uh, running on isolationism. War is way over there. We don't want that. Yeah. As soon as he got in, he got into the war. Yep. And started in, in the congressional, into Congress, put in propaganda. You know, we don't want... These guys are burning Belgian babies, and that became like to get these farmers. Eighty percent of America back in World War One, nineteen fourteen, was farmers, and they don't want that. Europe was way over there back then, and then um, you know he also put in the IRS, which is uh, another thing. But he put into prison people who fought, people union organizers, and also people yeah, who opposed the war. That's he just right. threw them in jail, like like unconstitutionally. So the idea, like George Carlin talks about, the idea that you have rights. I think we've all learned that George was right, and he wouldn't he be called him a right winger now? Oh, of course they would. He would have he would have pushed back against the authoritarianism we just lived through. He would have pushed. He would have seen through Dr. Fauci and this whole. He would yeah. have saw through all of it. I mean, he has that whole bit about well, you can't be afraid of viruses and germs. We, we grew have, up in shit. Yeah, that's right. We swam in shit. If, yeah, that's right. If I drop a piece of food off my plate and it lands on the floor, if I'm eating outside on the street in Calcutta, I pick it up and eat. <laughs> Yeah, remember that? I yeah. love George. You know what? At the end, because I saw his last show that he had, it was up in the, the, the he specialty tapes. Yeah, Sam Rosen. I saw that. It was great. It was, it was just, still great. He was just you could tell he was he, he was old, very old at the time, but yeah. he was still super sharp. But I I did feel at the time the last ten years that his view of humanity was very bleak and dark, and I didn't agree with it. But now I'm coming to that. I hope I'm not just in my 50s and I'll go, ah, these kids today. Yeah. But I, I understand where he was coming from. But I, I am I am very optimistic. Yes. At the time, I thought he was a little too cantankerous. Yeah. But now, <laughs> I totally get what he was. He was, ahead of his his age. he was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time as usual. I wasn't as good as him and as far as, or as clairvoyant as him. And I would hope, I would hope that... Um, 
some of the stuff on like my last comedy special. I would hope that he would have touched on some of those things. Yes. Anyway. You're great. By the way, let me just tell people, your last comedy special is great. I thank I you. really loved it. Well, thank I mean, you. You, you, again, the t the topics that you chose of 99% of other comedians are going to be afraid to attack them in an intelligent way and in a funny way and you did that. Well, thank you. My my goal is to is to make people laugh first and foremost, but I still think that like the you have to be a comic to to, to be an artist of your time, you have to talk about your times. You know, and I was good friends with Dick Gregory. And they produced that lovely special about him. Andre Gaines was the director, terrific director. And I would say like, because Dick Gregory, because, uh, you know, at the time when I was making movies for like Disney, <laughs> I could hire whoever I wanted, you know. And they said, so why don't we get Dick Gregory to come in and play the, the, this guy, the bathroom attendant. And they say, he's funny. And my dad loved him. So I got to get Dick Gregory and paid him whatever. And he got there, you know. And I said, Dick, it's not getting better. How could you say it's getting better? Oh, it's definitely getting better. Things are definitely getting better. Definitely getting better. And I said, how are you talking about it? At that time, there was a guy in Houston that was dragged behind a car. Right, I remember African-American, dragged behind a car. And I said, how could you say that it's getting better when that? And he said, well, you heard about it, didn't you? Now they have to do something about it. In the old days, you would have never heard about it. That's an improvement. And I went, like, wow, what an incredible insight he had. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he was right, you know. So I do think that, like, light exposes well is the greatest disinfectant and we're getting a decent amount of light exposing the way things are working and the inter uh interaction the the the, the um interactions of the, the myriad of real control over our over our uh western culture and and hopefully it'll survive this attack on western culture which seems to be happening on, on every forefront because the system is vulnerable i mean it's a great republic the separation of of powers was absolutely brilliant but it is it is susceptible. The to, price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And it, what? Yeah, yeah. I, now I just forgot what the next thing I was going to say. It is vulnerable. You can buy every senator. You can buy every congressman. You can buy. You can figure out how to control uh, uh, the regulatory boards. You really can. But at a certain point, I would think that the it's, it people will have to wake up to the fact that it is complete utter corruption. And like as John Cleese says, the the history of mankind is a history of crime mm -hmm. it is all a crime isn't yeah it? yeah history's ugly baby history's <laughs> ugly other than that i'll well, be playing at yuck yucks up in Canada this week <laughs> well let me let me just let me just give people a little taste of what your special is this is a little i think this is a minute long let's Thank just show you. them a little I knew this country was in trouble when I went to a bank and the guards like, excuse me, sir, you're in a bank, you have to wear a mask. <laughs> this was going to be a deposit, now it's a robbery. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in this together. <laughs> Men can't have babies. I don't care what they say. Oh, I feel something. Take some Metamucil. This problem's going to work its way out. <laughs> A woman is someone who gets mad at you for something you did three years ago. I want a pilot who says, we're going down in three languages. I don't feel good now. He gave me COVID. Now I have COVID. We're going to lose to China. <laughs> if Joe Biden was a dog, you put him down. Aliens are real. You should take a drink before this next joke. I'm serious. <laughs> Rob Schneider, Woke Up in America, streaming now on Fox Nation. Thank you for showing that. Thank you. So that was that was great. That was uh, really, I enjoy. Oh, man, it's really the way you, uh, I, your story about Trump was funny. That's true story. It's such a fun, <laughs> I, you can tell it's a true story. It's so funny. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, I was very grateful to Fox Nation who, uh, they just didn't have a problem with the material. And I will say that, like, you know, it's, uh, it was a breath of fresh air. Because I was, I held my breath and I like see what they say, and they said, "No, we're fine with all of it." So I was just grateful because at the end of the day, that's really this is what I wanted to say. You know, that's what I wanted to say. It's it kind of summed up for me comedically, like five hours of comedy material down to like what really worked, about hour fifteen, you know, hour and a half, and then, and then uh, that's kind of like what I felt. And what I felt like the relief for the audience was when I would perform for them. You know, you sense that. Like when I saw that 
the bit that Robert Kennedy put out about you. Mm-hmm. Wasn't that how beautiful is that? Huh? Yeah, it was really nice. And that put out about you saying like, <laughs> this research, that just, mm-hmm. that's reading. Yeah. It's so succinctly, because I'd heard that for a year and a half and I was just yeah. as angry. But you were able to like be like a laser and say, this is really what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. And it was beautiful. And you could feel the relief. Isn't that a beautiful thing to give it's an audience re- relief? Well, there's the tension and then comedy comes in and releases that tension. <laughs> And yes, yeah, some people cheer, you know, and I was afraid that when I started touring, people wouldn't want to hear those bits because they already saw them on my special, but they get this the bigger kick out of them, hearing me say it again, because like we all get to experience it as a group. Yeah. And you know what's funny? It's like you're, you're special. You have almost the exact same message as, as I have <laughs> now on stage. I'm not kidding. Even two of our jokes are almost the same verbatim. Yeah. And... Because you're not excluded. It's funny. You go up in your special, and I don't want to. But anyway, you you talk about all you're in, you're doing your special in Florida, and you yeah. talk about all these assholes that are moving to Florida, these yeah. liberal assholes from California, and and then everybody cheers, and you go, yeah, I'm a liberal asshole. From California. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's I'm true. one of them. I'm one of them. <laughs> it's true. And I I, I I want to admit that because I mean that's the I mean liberalism is the right way to be it really is it really is it's about that's why it's i'd like to have an actual return to it Mm -hmm. because it's about freedom of speech it's about an honesty and an openness to the truth whatever that is and it is about not judging people by the color of their skin it's about women's rights and gay rights and freedom and and that's why like i will have to say the last time i felt the democratic party actually representing that was when they had no power well, that's easy to represent that when you have no power, right? Because you don't have to do anything. That's right. Just like as soon as they lost the House, they introduced a Medicare for all bill that they wouldn't introduce Democrats. They wouldn't introduce when they had power. So, you know, yeah. so that's the game. Yeah, that is the game. And I'm glad that people are waking up to it. And I'm glad for your voice because they were one of the lone voices out there of sanity for me as I was trying to look for it. I mean, literally. I mean, literally, I know you have your 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 fans who will and your your followers who are, are loyal and get that, but there really is important because it was not easy to find. There really wasn't. So that's why one of the good things about like the potentiality for the internet to provide actual freedom and liberty for people, because that's what we all hoped when it came out, you know. But the the problem is, as Noam Chomsky talks about again, it's like people just go find their own political vacuum in their echo chamber and they just stay in that. Whereas, you know, it's important to like the potential. And I do think like it will open up and I do think social media will open up. But it, it the potential trap that the actual trap that it is, which is exposed and the fact that not one Democrat has a problem with the government interfering and using propaganda, not one would stand up and agree this is wrong is really telling. Like the Twitter files, you saw the Democrats. Yeah. Got, the Democrats in Congress got they they grilled and de- and demeaned and discredited the, the journalists Matt Taibbi and Schellenberger when they had them in front of them in Congress. Instead of being if, grateful, it, 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 who's the enemy of journalism? A goddamn liberal Democrats are the I, enemy of journalism. They're the ones trying to kill Julian Assange right now. They're the yeah. remember you get in trouble for not lying, you get in trouble <laughs> for telling the truth, right? Yeah, for Tucker, exposing hypocrisy. Tucker Carlson got fired not for lying he got fired for telling the truth about the war in big pharma just like julian assange is in prison not for lying but for telling the truth about the war machine just like edward yeah. snowden's in russia not because he lied but because he exposed that the government was committing crimes against its own people and yeah. so you'd never get in trouble for lying you always well, get in trouble that's why rachel maddow gets a hundred thousand dollars a day because she's willing to lie for the establishment the big pharma and the military industrial complex what i happens, mean not li- not just getting it wrong she's lying go ahead what happens when the government doesn't have a real enemy they have to keep spending that money that's right and they make the people the enemy that's what's happened and that you have the that the gigantic there's another industry that grew up after 9 11 as you know which was the spying the spying yes. entity which was just which had its tentacles and every admit in in every the surveillance state the surveillance state and that that's money and they're not going to give that money up. No. And so they're going to keep and they'll keep focusing that on the the perceived enemy which is their own people. And that was that's very telling that that's and that's going to continue. And that's why like the Moms for Liberty are like this extremist terrorist group. It's really interesting to say like, uh, moms are like they're funded. They're funded by who? By other moms, you know. So uh, it is a um quite telling but I, I do think that the uh, that the American people are good people, and you know when you travel around, they make sense. 
Yes. They want to do the right thing. They all, yes. And so I, I do think that they will come to a place of reason. And I do think now you have, with this new exposure to what's happening with this- Hotez. Uh, yeah, with, with with everything that's happening. I mean, thank God for Twitter and, and Elon Musk. And I was- you know, cautiously optimistic when he took over Twitter, and it's not fantastic. It's not perfect. It's not, but but it's, but it's just just for getting Hotez exposed is worth it. Yeah, it does. It just that that is a big dent, and and what you have to do is like you put enough dents into this uh, tyranny, and eventually it'll give in. It'll collapse. All they have is narrative control, Rob. That's all they have. Well, isn't it? What like can and you imagine they, Hitler? Goebbels, mm, right, you know, that, forget they wouldn't have had to attack. They wouldn't have had to attack Poland if they right. could control everything. Yep. They could have kept Poland. Why would you want to bomb a place, right? If, if you, you can just, just control, control it and tell people, you know, that's the thing about. I forget who said it about slavery, but the best way to get slaves is not to know to not let them know that they're enslaved. That's right. And then you then you then you have complete control. And so that that's what's so interesting about like Facebook and the concentration of Google and Google, you know, and YouTube silencing Robert Kennedy. That that was a. Um, I mean, I think they're foolish to do that, and I think that exposes them. And I do think I that enough people will wake up and go, you know what? Whether they're Democrat or Republican or an independent, they go, well, that is wrong. And I do think that that uh, that disinfectant of light to the fact that we know that they were able to that they we know that they um, that Robert Kennedy said that they had uh, you know uh, cut that out of um, YouTube and censored it. I think that that is is going to be a good step towards um, what I think has to happen was another kind of of regulations. I mean, I'm against like government control of everything, but like I do think you need to have if you are going to say you are the marketplace of ideas, you have to be a marketplace of ideas. You can't be the one controlling censorship. I don't know what that regulation would be, but I do think getting rid of 230 would certainly be a good step. I'd love to sue this shit out of Google. Yeah. So what you're saying is that. There's a regulation that you can't sue Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You can't because the just like you can't sue a bookstore for a libelous thing said in a book, you sue the publisher. Yeah. You so you can't they, they're they're pretending that what they're saying is that Facebook and Twitter and so they're that they're both things at once. That they're not a publisher, that they're yeah. a bookstore, so you can't sue them. But but they also can censor you. So if they are censoring, if if if, if a bookstore owner opens a book and starts censoring lines in the book, they are now liable. Yes. And that's what they've taken away from Facebook and Twitter and all the social media is that they're not liable However, for that. So they, they get are, to do both things. And if they are equal profit participants in this book, that's right. Then they should be. They should they're there is definitely a call that can be made that this is hypocritical and that that should protection should be taken away. Agreed. So we'll, it should we'll, be taken away. Trump Trump threatened to do that. He threatens a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> hey, come see us on tour. We'll be in Baltimore, San Francisco, Huntington Beach, Rosemont, and Chicago, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, New York City, Pottstown, Pennsylvania, Stamford, Connecticut, and more. And St. Louis. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for all our tickets for all our shows.